Hi there, this is Carl Irwin, and this is a uh, brief tutorial on the subject of film score Q calculation. Um, this is uh, something that's uh, kind of come up in my thinking recently. Uh, I am a Linux user, uh, I am a composer, uh, and a Linux user, so I operate off of Linux. There's plenty of very powerful music creation tools in Linux. Uh, we have uh, several uh, digital audio workstations that are native to Linux, uh, also cross-platform. Uh, we have um, also a number of instruments and uh, plugins that are native to Linux that are very powerful. We have a number of open source sound libraries that are extremely powerful as well. Uh, and one of those uh, kind of more native originating um, uh, pieces of software is MuseScore. So I do all of my uh, notation in MuseScore, and I have for quite some time, even since the very early years of MuseScore. Um, the last program that I used for notation was about 20 years ago. I used uh, Finale, and that was what I learned on and went through my music schooling uh, using. And I did a number of film scores on Finale before Finale had the capability to sync to picture. Uh, so that's the subject here because what has happened is MuseScore has up, uh, uh, I don't want to say upgraded, it has, it has uh, been redefined as MuseScore 4. Now certainly there are some upgrades to the program, particularly in the playback engine and the sampled sound set that is native to the program. Um, there's also some, of course, upgrades to the engraving, which is a major focus for the project. But there's a lot of regressions. Uh, there are a number of regressions in terms of access to MIDI data. Uh, and there's also a very significant regression for anybody that was using uh, MuseScore for uh, synchronization. If they were using the program using Jack, um, uh, real-time uh, audio service in uh, Linux or or even in one of the other platforms because Jack is cross-platform as well. Uh, if they were using uh, those synchronization tools, uh, those are gone. They, they don't exist. Uh, Jack was removed from uh, MuseScore and it's got a number of people like myself who used uh, MuseScore with that capability kind of left hung out to dry because there's, there's a lot of things we just can't do, particularly film scoring, uh, scoring the picture. So um, what are the options? What are the options? Well, we could dump MuseScore and move to another distribution, another platform and distribution and, uh, you know, use something else and pay a lot of money for it. Um, you can use the most recent stable version of MuseScore, which will eventually be antiquated. Uh, unfortunately, which is MuseScore 3.6. Um, and of course, you don't get any of the benefits of the new program in terms of the play engine. Uh, you could compose scoring to picture from there and then export your uh, file and then bring it into MuseScore 4 to uh, render it out. That's you know a couple steps that you could do in there. Um, there are some options, but the options have limitations, a number of hoops to jump through, and ultimately those options are going to run out because the uh, previous application eventually will be antiquated. It won't really work anymore. So what do we do? Well, we can go back to the Stone Age. That's something we can do. So let's talk about what, what is involved in uh, the kind of classic era of film score before we had the tool sets, the technology tool sets, to score to picture. You're not going to find this information in too many places, so I'll just uh, share it here, and you can share this with whoever might uh, be interested. I will share this uh, file with you in the comment section, or in the um, uh, uh, description, and so that you can download it. Just a simple PDF with uh, explanation and a couple of examples. Let me take you through it. Um, film score Q calculation. Uh, SMPTE format, this is the timecode format, hours, minutes, seconds, and frames. So uh, what this means is that you have uh, the typical time increments, but frames is related to the number of frames per second in the actual media. So frames per second, uh, common frames per second would be 24 frames per second, which is for film. It's actually 23 point something, uh, and that has, uh, I think, been... Uh, averaged up to 24 frames uh, in most 
uh, software applications these days. Uh, just as we've moved into digital, it has become 24 frames at an even rounded number. So that's really what you're going to see if you're in Europe. I believe you'll see 25 frames on uh, the um, uh, PAL format, PAL. Um, you could have 48 frames per second, which is double that, which has become kind of the new um, film stock ever since Peter Jackson and the Hobbit series, uh, and, and he forced, the studio forced the projection houses to adopt 48 frames and move to digital. Uh, that is also something that you'll see in big blockbuster films and some film projects that are particularly concerned with high definition. Um, you will also see 30 frames per second or 60 frames per second, uh, which is more related to television. Uh, and there's some other ones in between as well. Uh, but anyway, frame rate is dealing with the number of frames per second. Um, we are focusing mostly on uh, the minutes and seconds, as most cues will fall into this time range. This is what we're going to be dealing with, is minutes and seconds, not hours necessarily. Frame number, which is the orange over here, can help to approximate hits or import uh, important visual uh, events in the film. With a frame rate of 24 frames per second, uh, numbers under 12 are closer to the previous second, and numbers over 13 are closer to the next second. Um, the general rule is that sounds within one quarter of a second to a visual event are perceived as associated with that event. It's a psychological truth. If something happens within a quarter of a second, about 2 point, uh, 0.25, 0 0.2 seconds, uh, it will be, that sound will be associated with the event that it is within that range, uh, too. Six frames represent one quarter of a second required to force association at 24 frames per second. So if you're within six frames of the second that you're looking at, um, the sound that you're generating on that, at that moment will be associated with that hit. Okay. Uh, if it's on the rounded second. Uh, and within six frames of that uh, particular spot. So keep that in mind. Um, preliminary concept of time versus beats. This is really important to understand or else you'll really mess up your calculations. You can potentially uh, have all of this come out wrong and then you'll be frustrated uh, when you go to render. Time represents what has already occurred. Okay, this means that at one second, one second has already passed. Time begins at zero and ends at a number. So remember when you're dealing in time, the beginning of time is zero. But in contrast to that, beats represent what is going to happen. So beat one begins at zero. Okay, beat one actually starts at the marking zero. A beat is not something that has happened. A beat is something that is happening. So just have to remember that when you're doing calculations. So the first step in establishing a canvas of time is to calculate the beats per second, BPS going forward, at the chosen tempo. Pick any tempo you want. Or beats per minute. Okay, so for a uh, number of beats per second at a given tempo, let's uh, look here at this basic formula. This is a really cheap easy concept here to follow. Formula is beats per minute divided by 60 equals the beats per second. Really simple, okay? But you might not have thought about this, but this is what you need in order to calculate your uh, your hits, your, your Q. Example, 120 beats per minute was like really low-hanging fruit example here, right? 120 beats per minute, which is twice double 60, right? Two beats per second is two beats per second. And you kind of already intuitively know that, obviously, but that's the formula in action. You can do this with any beats per minute to get the total beats per second. Now, you really want to know what the beats per second are because it helps with calculation when you're trying to figure out exactly how many beats are in your queue based on the time range. Okay. Simpty ranges should be determined through the inclusion of all areas that require music with a small margin of several seconds after, especially after. You might even include a, a margin of several seconds before and then start your time code count uh, a couple seconds in. And that's usually how I do it. If I'm going to extract footage from the work print uh, with a time code on it, I'll usually extract with a couple seconds ahead of where I'm actually developing my cue. If I'm working out of a digital audio workstation, that gives me a couple seconds of uh, uh, time before I actually have to start recording, and that's very helpful. Um, BPM numbers are easiest to calculate if the start and end SMPTE range is at zero frames. You don't have to do this. You can start your count at any frame number, but it is a little easier, I think, to just kind of take the frames out of the equation, and that way, whenever you're dealing with a frame count at the point that you're looking at for a hit, you're, you're dealing with the frame count from zero seconds. Just easier to think, I think, if you're taking all of the frame rate to zero and doing your calculations from there. 
Uh, otherwise, you're always going to have to subtract or add the frame count that you have at the starting point, and that's a bit of a headache. You're getting approximations, right? You don't have, I mean, it, that's how people would do it if they're playing into a digital audio workstation. They're approximating mostly by chance what the hits are going to be. Um, this is more precise than that. So uh, our approximation here is going to be even closer than that. Uh, the total SMPTE range for the synchronization footage might be, for example, 1 hour, 22 minutes, 34 seconds, 0 frames, uh, to 1 hour, 23 minutes, so 1 minute forward, but not a whole minute, and 17 seconds in 0 frames. And the total SMPTE range for the musical cue might be as follows. So I have a, a couple seconds uh, a margin on either end. Uh, 1 hour, 22.38 to 1 hour, 23.14. Okay. If the chosen beats per minute is 144 beats per minute, so we'll make an example here, then the beats per second equation is 144 divided by 60, and that gives us a beats per second of 2.4 beats per second. And that's very important to know uh, as you're considering a frame number later on to decide how you're going to uh, determine your hit on the beat. Okay. It is easier to calculate the total number of beats for cue by first determining the beats per second, as many cues will fall under a minute. Most cues are not very long, okay? I mean, the project I did 20 years ago was 30 minutes, and I really calculated the entire thing, and I wrote beginning to end, and I mapped it all out. Um, you're not usually going to do that. Usually you're going to extract a minute or two of footage and then create a cue for that minute or two of footage, and then you'll blend them together. Okay, But we always want to work in seconds. We don't really want to work in minutes plus seconds. This information can also be helpful in aligning notation values to hits in the picture by frame number, as I mentioned. With a calculation of 2.4 beats per second, the composer can align hits to the eighth note value and well within the approximate one quarter of a second maximum offset. Um, needed to create a psychological association of sound with a given event. So your hit doesn't have to be on a beat. It could be on the and count, halfway through a beat. It really can be anywhere you want. We're going to look at ways to kind of put the, your hits in the strongest metrical place in a minute. But just keep in mind that the hit can be accounted for in the notation anywhere you want to. Uh, and you can deal with it any way you want to. Note, <clears throat> With the one quarter of a second rule, it is advantageous to favor late sounds over early sounds. So what I'm saying here is that it is traditionally better if you're going to have a sound off of the actual visual event by a margin. It is better that it happens later than if it happens earlier, even if you're within a quarter of a second for that psychological association. You generally don't want to favor having the sound happen a quarter of a second before the visual event. You want to favor having it happen after. And if it, have, it happens after, you can actually increase that amount of time. You could have a hit and have the cue happen a whole second after that hit. And because it happens after, and depending on the type of musical gesture that's being uh, performed, uh, that will be associated with that moment. Cues often work that way, very frequently. Um, you, as you know in film, you'll see that that's true, right? Um, so let's take a look here at an example. The total number of seconds for the cue is uh, 22 minutes, 38 seconds. I underline 30 sec 38 seconds here for a minute. And 23, 14, we're looking at the seconds uh, related to the minute. So in order to do this calculation, simple math, you take 60 seconds, which is a minute minus the 38 that's there, and you get the difference up to the next second, which is 22. Okay, so we're 22 shy of the next second, a uh, total of 60. And then you add on the next uh, um, total of seconds, which is 14. That gets us <clears throat> 36 total seconds. So we have 36 seconds for our Q. That is what we're operating off of. So now we take 2.4 beats per second, which is from 144 beats per minute, times 36 seconds, and that gives us 86.4 total beats. So we're looking at 86 or 87 beats of time at 144 beats per minute for our Q. This number can be rounded up or down given the nature of the margins in the synchronization footage. It is important to include an additional margin of time following any essential concluding hits in the footage. The audio may involve reverberation or decay of sound, and this should be factored into the margins of the SMPTE range. There's even a technique where people will end their cues with a fade out, a sustained note or a fade out that's easily um, 
uh, sequenced with other cues or with the uh, soundtrack. So it's just easier to edit with kind of a sustained tone that fades out at the end, and the editor can use that however they wish. This entire procedure can be offset by frame number to generate more accuracy. However, the techniques for lining beats in step two uh, may be cleaner and more streamlined than adjusting the whole empty ranges by frame number. So you can, like I said, start at uh, a number and so many frames, but I think it gets a little tricky. It's just easier to work off of a zeroed out frame number uh, and then move on from there. Once the total number of beats has been established, essential visual hits can be addressed by using the same equations to identify the beats that best match with the hits. As mentioned before, sounds occurring after visual event are better associated with the event, and sometimes a subdivision of a beat will better accommodate the timing of the hit. For example, if the range of 1 hour 22.38 to 23.14, a hit occurs at 22.55 and 7 frames then this would be associated with 17 seconds. We get there by taking 55 minus 38, which was the starting number, and that gets us a difference of 17. This is 17 seconds in, plus 7 frames at 24 frames per second. That's the actual spot that we're looking at. Okay, Musically, at 144 beats per minute, the hit is happening on beat 40.8. Okay, so 40.8, that's 2.4 beats per second times 17. Almost beat 41, just shy, about a quarter shy, right? For the hit to be effective after the action, we would round up to beat 41. So we want our hit to be after that. And if we add the seven frames, which is just over a quarter, about the difference here, following the second uh, of the following second, we can establish that beat 41 is likely a musical hit. So 41 would be a very accurate slam dunk for that sound. Or, on the safe side, beat 42 could function as a reactive effect to the action. So one second late hit to the moment. And, and I, I, I kind of favor this. I, I tend to favor safe margins when you're working in this way. So unless you're dealing with a horror movie and a stinger, and it's got to be dead on, and honestly, in which case, if you're doing that, usually you're just going to take a sound and you're just going to drop that one sound into the video, the AV project. You're not really going to write. You're not going to write that musically. You're just going to record a sound and then place that one file where it belongs. You won't be thinking of it in metrical music. Okay. Uh, I tend to favor the late kind of uh, recognition of the visual element. Okay. So take the next beat. Is always a good rule of thumb. Uh, and then write write your music a little understated. Okay, so it's not it's not overt. You know, it's, don't put a stinger sound late. That would be ridiculous. But you could put a swell or a run or some other kind of gesture right a little bit later. Especially if the gesture takes some time. If it's a, a beat late, uh, it will easily be and very artfully be associated with that moment. So just some things to think about. This process should follow to should be followed to determine the beats that align with important hits throughout the queue. So you do this for every hit. You'll do this uh, process and find out what beats best relate. After the hits are translated into beats, the metrical changes that will be placed that will place hits in the strongest locations within the musical phrasing can be determined. Note. Accounting for too many hits can result in a comical score akin to classical cartoon music. This effect is known as Mickey Mousing. If you've never heard that before, Mickey Mousing is like, like what you see in Tom and Jerry cartoons, right? Where absolutely everything that happens gets a musical gesture. And it's just, it's just kind of over the top and silly, right? And you don't really want to do that. You want to be spare. You want to be sparing with the number of hits that you account for and just kind of focus on the salient things that are most important. Hits should be applied sparingly, and unless the hit is a vital accent in the picture, the musical gesture accompanying it can often be subtle and understated to avoid distraction or over-accentuation. Okay, don't overdo your music. Example. So here's an example based on what we've just discussed. A cue made up of 86 beats has hits at beats 1, 23, 43, 74, and 83. Given the hit on beat 1, the meter intended for most of the music can be started at this point, to test how it lies with those hits. Assuming that a 3-4 uh, time signature is used, this would result in over 28 measures of music. 
hits would occur in the following location. So here's the whole queue with the hits that we've listed. We have a hit on beat 1, we have a hit on beat 23, a hit on beat 43, a hit on beat 74, and a hit on beat 83. A couple of these line up on the downbeat of a measure, and then three of them line up on beat 2. Some of these hits are on weaker parts of the measure, beat 2. Musically speaking, beat 2 can be accentuated without changing the meter. It's not too hard to accentuate beat 2 in 3-4 uh, time. Um, while beat three would be more problematic, okay? But we can accommodate these hits, however, by adjusting the meter within a phrase or at the end of a phrase. The addition of metrical beats can emulate musical holds, fermatas, or extensions while reducing the need to actually change tempo. You don't want to have to change tempo. Every time you change tempo in a film score means that you have to recalculate. And sometimes those calculations can get really, really complex because you get into a time that actually does involve frames and now you have to calculate away from the frame uh, unless you go to the next, you know, zeroed out moment in the time code. Uh, it can get tricky. So if you want to avoid having to change tempo if you if you can can manage it. Well-positioned metrical changes can also be easier to read and perform for uh, live ensembles. One solution for the meter may be as follows. Bar lines have been added to indicate potential phrasing. Extended measures can be scored as obvious changes. So obviously the meter is changing here and the music says so. Um, or um, they can be uh, portrayed as sustained tones, thereby accounting for the extra beats but without portraying a change in meter. Uh, specifically. So here's what we have. I've added some measures in here. You can see I've got uh, one, two, three, four measure phrase in three, four. Then I've got one, two, three measures. And on the third measure, you have a four, four bar. There's one extra beat in there. Uh, that re then makes beat 23 line up perfectly on beat one of the next phrase. So it can be sustained note with a, a beat uh, acting as a caesura, or it can be one note sustained all the way through and then it leads here. It feels kind of like a sustained fermata, right? Those are the, the ways you could use it. You could, you could do a three, four bar, use the first three, but then you could put a run on beat four that leads to this. And that would be kind of, that would fit musically inevitably it would be an inevitable feature, right? People could, could kind of foresee that happening, and it would make sense when it does happen. There's a lot of options, but this then creates a downbeat that is strong for this hit. Let's go on from here. You have one, two, three, four measure phrase, and again, at the end of the phrase, we have one extra beat. So you, again, you have that kind of sustain, or you can... Uh, so you could suggest a retardando going on here, okay, a retard at the very end of it, even though it's metrically not that way, there's not actually a slowing down, we've just added a beat, but it can apply a retard. You can do that by changing the uh, note values as well. You can use dotted rhythms, or you can use triple duple uh, contrast, right, which I think I mentioned that later on in the document. Next phrase, beat uh, uh, starts on this measure, you have a 3-4 and then a 4-4, four, four, two measure kind of subphrase here and the same idea again leading into this next uh, hit. Then you have a long stretch. One, two, three, four measure phrase. One, two, three, four measure phrase. And then again you have two measures just like in a couple of other places here where the second measure is a four, four bar and you could use one of those devices that we've been talking about. A sustain, a caesura, uh, a run, a lot of possibilities. And then you have a hit here. And then you have a hit down here on the last one. This, of course, could be a sustained tone for the last hit. So this is how you make your hit strong by working with the meter. And you actually have, there. I, I do have to say, there is an advantage to this, doing it this way, than just playing into the workstation. Because playing into the workstation, you don't necessarily foresee things happening. There's just kind of dumb luck, right? You do it and you kind of stick with your meter and things kind of line up well or they don't. Uh, and then you can shift things around. It's a lot of trial and error. When you work in this way, you really eliminate a lot of trial and error. There's not really much trial and error. It's, it's mostly about design. Um, now I'm not, <laughs> I'm not giving the MuseScore people a license to just leave synchronization off of their software, right? I'm not saying this is better. I'm just saying it's good to know these techniques because it does create a very intricate map that can create very intricate and very uh, effective, accurate cues uh, for your film.
right? At this point, musical ideas can be applied to the given phrase designations and metrical changes. Again, it's important to recognize that metrical changes do not have to be obvious. Extra beats can be utilized for pickup runs into the following downbeat. They can account for a caesura or a pause. Additionally, hit alignment may be established with changes in tempo. Be aware that each temp change in tempo will require recalculation from the time code location at which it changes. When fully produced, the sound recording can be queued up with the initial SMPTE code uh, for the queue and rendered into the soundtrack mix. Even at this late stage, minor audio editing adjustments, offset, splicing, crossfade, etc. can be made to improve or fine-tune the placement and accuracy of the queue, the final render. Okay. Considerations. Some final thoughts here before we close this out. This may be boring for some of you, but I really mean to share what I know because, again, you don't really find anyone talking about this anymore. It's antiquated, but it's still quite useful if you're, if you're stuck like me, you know, in this situation with your notation program. Uh, I might have a project where it might be better to just kind of do it the old school way because I can't, I can't score a picture in the program itself. Um, so if you have to do this, this is how it's done. Consideration. Some composers will choose to work from a finite menu of tempos that work well with time code calculations. So you could have like a menu of 60 BPM, 90, 120, 150, 180, 210. These are 30 BPM increments, and they will calculate really easily. They have relatively clear subdivisions when scaled against minutes and seconds. These options cover a wide range of tempo categories. So you can really cover the gamut with these, right? Likewise, meter choices can play a significant role in the occurrence of strong beats. For example, the time signature of 6-8 is a compound meter in two. There's only two beats, so you have a strong beat every other beat. At 120 beats per minute, this meter will create frequent strong beats and easy calculation, which is perfect for an action sequence or adventure theme with frequent hits. So using a very accessible beat per minute uh, uh, range um, and or base, and then using a meter that has frequent strong beats, you really set yourself up for, again, low-hanging fruit. It makes it easier. You don't have to do that. Now, I don't do this. I don't work off of a menu of tempos, but a lot of people do. A lot of people do just have the tempos that they like to use for film score. They have a slow tempo. They have a fast tempo. They might have one in between, and that's kind of how they operate. A more advanced technique can adjust for when a hit falls between beats. Uh, a prior meter change may involve the inclusion of an odd compound meter like 5-8 or 7-8 on a sustain or phrase ending to offset the next hit by half of a beat. The score can revert to the original meter and continue with this adjustment, or it can be offset by adding another odd compound meter uh, measure later on. So if I add a 5-8 or a 7-8, where you have, for 7-8, you have 1-2-1-2-1-2-3, that addition of one eighth note now offsets all subsequent beats by one half of a beat. And that might give me a strong downbeat to accommodate a hit that might be between beats later on. Um, as I'm saying here, you can then fix that in a later measure, add another one of these odd uh, compound measures, meter measures, and then it will kind of reverse the procedure. It's just important when you do this that you're accounting carefully for the beat numbers as you're displacing them by half of a beat. Okay. Some people like to write action music just using these odd compound meters because it gives you such opportunity for hits. You can really have a hit, like say in 7-8, either one of the duple downbeats could be strong or the triplet. And, and you can put them anywhere you want. The triplet can be in the beginning, the middle, or the end. You can, you can place it anywhere you want as long as you set it up musically. Um, you have a lot of options there. For calculation and click track creation, it may be better to deal with whole measure tempo changes when slowing down or speeding up. Many MIDI standard applications will only compute tempo changes at the start of a measure. Furthermore, accurately calculating a retardando over two measures in 4-4 may be accomplished more easily by adjusting the tempo for each complete measure. This can be tweaked in the click track project, but ultimately such tempo adjustments are not generally perceived as tiered upon listening. People don't really notice if you deal with tempo changes in that way. 
that's kind of the old school way of putting a retard into a notation playback file that doesn't play retard. Uh, you just change each subsequent measure through the course of a couple measures to imply the retard. And it's you'd be surprised at how hard it is to hear that that's what's going on. It sounds like a retard. So uh, dealing with film score click track creation, it's sometimes better to work in this way. Because uh, some MIDI programs can't handle a change in tempo mid-measure. Um, so just kind of a sidebar commentary about creating click tracks here. A simpler technique involves the notation of a rhythmic accelerando or retardando using note values in a static tempo. So without changing tempo at all, uh, a phrase uh, ending can employ syncopated dotted rhythms and contrasting triple-duple divisions to imply a change of speed into a hold, a cut, or a double halftime shift without changing the tempo or the meter. Right? So you could work from half note to um, a half note triplet, to quarter note, to quarter note triplet, to, you know, and so on. You kind of keep working duple, triple, duple, triple, and increase. And, and that's kind of stretching it a bit, because usually when you're doing this kind of thing, you're only doing it over part of a measure. So just a couple of increments that might be using duple, triple contrast or dotted rhythms, you can create the sense of time, a change in tempo, briefly, that isn't really in the click track. The, the, the tempo has not changed, but it creates a sensation to the listener that it has. I like to use that trick. That's my favorite trick to use when film scoring to kind of adjust the tempo, at the, particularly at the end of a phrase. Ultimately, the use of any tempo and meter is accessible if the equations and procedures are organized. Even if one uses a DAW and visually spots hits by chance, having an underlying knowledge of these calculations can save a lot of time and effort from trial and error. So these are the review of the calculations that we're talking about. BPS, beats per second, is uh, determined by beats per minute divided by 60. Total beats in a queue is the BPS number times the total seconds of the queue. Okay, that gives you the total number of beats. A hit beat is determined uh, equals the beats per second times the total seconds to a hit. So from the beginning of your range to the point of a hit times the beats per seconds gives you the location of the beat that is closest to it. The frame count at the simpty hit time provides additional approximation. It tells you how many more frames to approximate to determine whether you're on the beat that you mathematically determined or if you want to go to the next beat or if you want to um, give a subdivision for that hit uh, of the beat. So using the frame rate in the SMPTE code at the moment of the hit is very helpful in dialing in your musical hit. Um, it all depends on the frames per second of the film. you got to know your FPS if you're going to use the time code. Uh, another thing that's not on the document that you can do, before you write music, take your canvas, put a sound on each one of the hits, render that out, check it against the time code alignment just to be sure that everything is the way it's supposed to be. And then, and only then, start writing your music and you'll know that it's going to come out right. That was something that I did 20 years ago. Whenever I made my map, I would render that out before I started writing music because I just wanted to be sure. I wanted to confirm that I had things right. And it's it's a good way to, to identify mistakes. That's it. Boy, that's a lot of information. Hopefully, my talking through it makes it clear for you. Uh, again, you have this um, document available if you want to read through it and, and uh, analyze it a little bit. Um, it, 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 at most, if you understand what I'm getting at, you can just kind of print out this last page and just you know cut out this thing. Just remember what your formulas are and, and what order you're doing things in to determine something that you need to create a map. This is how you do it when you don't have video sync. And, and, and I want to say to the MuseScore people, right, people that are writing music for media, this is what we're stuck with. And uh, I, under, I do understand that you have 3.6. You can go back to that and use that feature. But, I mean, the way forward really means – let me put it this way. If the developers or the, the moderators there on the forum are saying, well, you can just go use 3.6 – if they're saying that, then they're actually acknowledging that there's a problem. If it really wasn't a, regress a regression, their reply would be, well, you don't actually need to have video sync. You can film score anyway.
I think really the best way forward is just to get that jack transport working again. I think that really is the best thing to do. Some people say they want to get away from Jack, but look, all these other applications are using it. Even Blender, like I said, is using it. And it's not like anybody makes a big deal out of it. Anyway, that's my rant on the problem and the solution. And this is useful for anybody, even if you're not a MuseScore user. If you're just writing film score and you want to know what the calculations are and how to achieve them using a pencil, pen, piece of paper, and a clock, um, that's how you do it. And uh, create a good detailed map. Put something in the comments here if you're if you have anything to add to this or any other suggestions or your if your experience differs a little bit from what I'm talking about here in terms of calculation. Uh, and uh, get the conversation going. So uh, that is my those are my thoughts on film score Q calculation. Good luck with that. Happy mixing.